Hi there, in uh, this video I just want to talk about some of the technical aspects that you have to give consideration to when creating your portfolio images. These things might include aperture, shutter speed, ISO and your white balance. So generally things you want to set up on your camera um, when you can do so to create the desired effect. Now, uh, we talk about these as if you're using a DSLR or one of the compact cameras as previously stated or sent out a list of there are apps you can get for your uh, mobile devices that allow you to have manual control over things like aperture, shutter, ISO and white balance within the phone camera so you can refer back to middle there's an announcement to post there that will uh, direct to apps that will do that but I've been on to uh, Unsplash and just picked up a few images briefly just wanted to talk about just to go hand in hand with the images that David was talking about, provide more of a technical aspect to these. So looking at the first one, we've got here um, a pattern of eggs in, a, in an egg carton with some side lighting that also provides some texture uh, to it. Uh, not a great depth of field to this, so that would suggest a, a slight a uh, slightly uh, small aperture, a uh, well, wide aperture I should say, small number, wider aperture, so maybe a 2.8 um, judging by this because we can tell from the, I'm uh, bringing up in here, we can tell from the uh, depth of field here how this is quite soft oh. parts of the carton compared to the sharpness that's on the texture at the top of the shell that uh, quite a wide aperture has been used here and this side lighting that's coming in from this side, um, quite a large light source, maybe a window or something like that, is just giving us our texture that's lifting up the cardboard of the carton and the uh, the texture on the shell. Uh, shutter speed wise, uh, looking at this, it's, uh, it's fairly steady. So depending on the focal length of the lens, it's either the same as the focal length or higher. So quite a fast shutter speed perhaps a 60th and above 100th of a second and a natural white balance has been used to match the lighting coming through so if this was daylight coming through a window then the daylight setting has been used on the camera so it's a little sunshine icon looking back can use my keyboard I've got my pen up let's uh, look at the next image Our next one here uh, are repeating elements found in nature. Um, on this leaf here, these are very, very defined lines going in here. So this uh, this image screams sharpness um, to a certain point. The depth of field is disappearing just at the top here. It's just starting to get a bit softer as we get the top here but everything is nice and crispy sharp here. And looking at a plane of focus here and here. So I would say, judging by that, we might be looking on a macro image of what a F11, maybe 16 plus on this one. Um, with it being such a close focus image that the uh, the depth of field obviously gets accentuated you have to go higher up and with the the edges being quite soft there and up there i would say that the uh, the aperture is quite high quite a high number and the shutter speed is extremely fast just look at how sharp these lines are make you feel like if you touch them you would actually cut your finger so a high aperture and a high shutter speed here has given us uh, a very crisp final uh, image. Uh, the desired effect for this one with the repeating element of being these lines here. This leaf structure, I'm just going to reduce this one. I think the image is a bit bigger than, than, uh, than my screen, or a bit smaller. I should say the image is a bit smaller than my screen, sorry. Uh, look at the uh, the image here. Again, uh, I would say there's a shallow depth of field being used here. I would say like an f4 and f2.8 
at this point because these uh, these lines here are very sharp. But these lines, the uh, I, don't, I don't actually know what you call these parts of the leaf, but these lines here, which are raised and therefore closer to the camera, but only by millimeters, are slightly softer. So I'd say a very shallow depth of field has been used here. Again, possibly a slower shutter speed, because on close inspection, when you look at these, rather than being out of focus or soft, I think there could be a slight movement of this leaf moving ever so slightly. So, again, that might lead to some of this blurriness on the colour, this uh, gradient here on this backlit leaf. So, with an aperture slightly higher, f4, f5.6, might have got all this nice and sharp and in detail as well as these areas here. But um, if I was just doing something that was maybe framing up just this section, then I would stick with that wide aperture. But if I'm going for something much bigger, then I would try and push my aperture that little bit higher just to make sure that these parts are in focus as well. Got to remember to switch off my pen. New software reason, it's 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 really handy, it's really great. I'm, I'm enjoying it, but I keep forgetting um, what I have to do between the pen and the uh, and control of my computer. Um, there's not a lot of keyboard shortcuts for it. See, like I just tried to grab something there. I need I need like a, a keyboard shortcut between the pen and the arrow. Anyway, this next image. Um, very abstract, great splashes of colour brought in from the bokeh in the background of the, the lights, nice sharp water droplets on the window, um, looking out here, again there's a bit of texture to it, you can feel it, this is how wet this is, like if you rub your hand through it, the smeary window and stuff like that, um, but it also, it's just a really nice abstract textured shot. Now, repeating elements you might get away with that color there's options here and it's usually the more of the abstract image that will provide you more options in terms of what your shots could be used for and the simplicity of this one as well is that it's a shallow depth of field concentrating the focus point purely on the droplets in front it's not shot straight onto the window and we can tell this because of how our focus drops out here and drops out here. If we were straight on to the window, standing straight on facing it, then we would have sharpness edge to edge. Whereas we've got it sharper down this corner and sharper down this corner. So we're shooting down the window plane like this. So it's always better to remember that if you want sort of uh, sharpness edge to edge, on these type of shots. If this is your window, then your camera sensor needs to be straight on as well. Okay, just to get that edge to edge sharpness. Whereas if you have your window and you come at it slightly off, even just slightly like this, then you'll end up with softness in the corners of the window. Okay, so again, all this is is a, a nice fast shutter speed. We've got no droplets running down, no smearing, nothing like that, nothing traveling. It's nice and crisp and a shallow depth of field. Again, you're looking at something like an f4, f2.8, depending on the focal length of the, the lens, but something that's then thrown out these window lights into these lovely circular and squarish Bokka pools of light in the background just give us a nice palette of colour and abstractness. Saying that though, you know, I, I said like, you know, these sort of simple images and it's simple in terms of content, but it's not really simple in terms of execution. You know, these things, these, uh, these images that look simple, that have this minimalistic feel of just abstractness to them, are uh, generally the ones that are much, much harder to execute. 
So for this one, we have a um, person walking by, I can't remember what I put in for search in this one. I think it was the leading lines, the, the pavement, the wall lines leading us, or I can't remember what it was on here. But what I liked about this one was the very subtle use of shutter speed that just adds an extra bit of dimension to this. And this is something where um, beginning photographers are usually going one way or another, so it's fast shot speed to make sure everything's nice and crisp or a slow shot speed to get blur and the hard job is actually getting that sweet spot that sweet shot of speed where things are crisp and in focus uh, the scene is set but there's just that slight hint to add to the narrative and this has been accomplished here and that the shot of speed is just slow enough where there's just slight movement going on around the feet and the bag still moving however points of interest are nice and sharp and in focus so the main central line of focus is in uh, nice and sharp being frozen but just this slight movement around the feet that just help accentuate that sense of traveling through the image and uh, obviously this works quite well colour-wise and that this counterbalances against these two colours here as well so it makes your subject stand out nice and clearly. I'll also say as well that the white balance that's been used here is one that's been used to cool the image down a bit so slightly um, slightly colder temperatures on the white balance and um, perhaps the uh, cloudy setting that's my cloud, yeah, the sun, or even the uh, shade setting, which usually looks like, um, let that disappear a second, <laughs> which usually looks like a, a house, like that. Okay, so the cloudier shape one will cool this down a bit. Um, or you could even go a bit more extreme if you want to really bring out these blues and even start to introduce green into this one, and you can start to use that uh, tungsten setting. It looks a bit like this okay but it's always worth experimenting with those white balances to see what effect it can bring to your uh, to your images something quite uh, apt for our times here in this leading line shot and something to bear in mind about the leading lines and I know Dave has talked extensively about leading lines and we've got these leading lines of these empty shelves if he's been looking for bread or flour or anything like that recently, you'll know exactly what this this site looks like. Heading down to the bakery, and we can tell that um, quite a large, uh, quite a high aperture is being used here. Narrow aperture, pinhole almost. Uh, there's a great depth of field going through this image, even more so than a lot of the ones we've already looked at. And the fact that this is in focus, these labels are in focus all the way down to these labels these signs down here are absolutely pin sharp and that is all the way through the image and we're not so much at uh, uh, too much of an angle where this has been flattened but in fact this is quite a large uh, quite a lot of depth into this image here that's been used um, I would say a relatively high shutter speed as well because these tungsten lights um, one of the things you might encounter if you shooting inside something that I've had an issue with especially on mirrorless cameras and mobile phone mobile devices is that these lights at certain speeds on your shutter um, start to introduce this uh, this waviness it's almost like you can see the the light traveling you get these bands of white and dark light traveling up and down your image uh, banding so there's no banding here this is nice and clean um, so quite a high shutter speed being used as well as a high aperture which suggests to me and the way that these shadows have been lifted up in post-processing that a higher ISO was used so you might be looking at an ISO 1200, 1600 to get uh, this amount of detail and this amount of shadow detail in as well so I would think zooming in down here in these darker areas would highlight the noise going on but uh, this is a great shot for inside a supermarket these spotlights and these 
Uh, tungsten lights aren't always the easiest thing to shoot under. It's kept all the colours nice and saturated. Um, a lot of shadow detail being lifted there, which would suggest to me a high ISO to achieve that higher aperture and higher shutter speed. Good balance all around. So there's a couple of bird images here, and I just want to talk about some of the uh, the differences um, in these, uh, where different things, uh, different elements, and the technical aspects have been used. Uh, starting with this one, uh, this butterfly, this has quite a, a high aperture on it. There's a large depth of field. There's a lot of light. That's why we're shooting it upwards into a clear sky. Sunlight's coming in from this direction here. Uh, you can tell from the catch light in the eye that's pin sharp. Texture on the feathers is pin sharp. The uh, the shutter speed extremely high. There is slight blur at the back here, but that just helps accentuate our sense of traveling. But these these wings down here and up here are pin sharp. So I would say five hundredth of a second, maybe more, um, and a really solid depth of field as well. These aren't quite burnt out and uh, like I say that eye is absolutely pin sharp. Low ISO, there is next to no digital noise in here. It's a little bit here but that to me suggests that it's been lifted in post-production. Um, on the other hand our chicks Again, uh, great lighting, fast shutter speed. All these little feathers are um, perfectly still and crisp. Same here, these little dew drops. Very, very shallow depth of field, just hitting the eyes and no more. Um, very thin depth of field as well, which suggests a wide aperture, but also a very, very long focal length. So you might be looking at an F4 or an F5.6 on something like a three or four hundred mil focal length. However, there's a high aperture being used, I would say, on both of these, and it's just a little thing that's given away in the fact that although these are nice and sharp, they're not pin sharp, um, but they are as sharp as the digital noise will allow, and you can see it in how these parts here have been rendered and how the edges have been rendered compared to our other bird with the low ISO, these are just rendered a bit sharper. There's just a, a painterly softness to these that in no way detracts from the image. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm bringing 15 plus years, probably longer, of uh, technical expertise here to tell you that looking at this, this painterly effect is done through high. ISO or higher ISO. This might even be even just ISO 400 or 800 on these, not an awful high ISO, but just enough to give it this painterly softness compared to this digital crispness. Okay, there's no that doesn't detract from either image at all. If you have to push your ISO on your cameras to get that shutter to get that aperture, then you go for it. You push that ISO and you take that slightly more painterly softness in some of the other out of focus areas, okay, in order to group to get your image. Okay, don't think that if you have to push your ISO that you're then um, degrading your image or you're failing in some way, not at all. The ISO is there as a tool, it's just uh, you will get a slightly different quality to your image than you might be expecting, but you can use that to your advantage. On this next image here, this is a great uh, image of uh, the snowy owl, and well, I think it's a snowy owl, I'm just guessing it's a snowy owl. Um, but what I like about this is it's something that's used a lot in portraiture and bringing down the ambient light by using a faster shutter speed. Um, there's not a great depth of field to this, so the aperture has been used to balance out that high, ap that high shutter speed, that low ISO. Um, Looking into the front there, the ISO again might be about four or eight hundred, maybe even higher, twelve hundred, depending on the digital camera used. 
but this uh, this uh, faster shutter speed because the light source is coming down from this point that faster shutter speed as we increase the shutter speed um, the first thing the, the shutter speed will do will start to bring down the ambient light so it's just starting to create this pool of darkness around the bird by bringing down the shutter speed if we were to lower the shutter speed okay decrease it bring it down that would bring our ambient light up and the first thing that would get brighter would be these areas down here so your shutter speed you can use to control some of your ambient light and give you that push um, that might become a bit too evident in post-processing if you're darkening or lightening different areas in affinity photo for example then yeah, your shutter speed you can use in situ to help control the light uh, aperture will give you bigger jumps of light so if we change the aperture this area would jump up in lightness quite quickly but by tweaking the shutter speed this will just come up in increments of light so again something just a, a bit technically heavy but um, something you can just be aware of if you end up in that situation great use again of shallow depth of field and um, color wise as well a bit of warmth has been introduced into this to bring out the orange and yellow here but also add some warmth to these greens and darks of the water here as well a fairly fast shutter speed in that the uh, it's consistently sharp in the reflection as well as the main bird another one of those where not too fast a shot of speed not too slow a shot of speed enough to get the balance of movement and exposure quite well um, flame if you're doing flame photography anything well, I'd probably suggest you do but <laughs> If you do, um, you know, anything sort of like a 30th of a second um, to a 15th of a second is quite good for getting just these lot, these uh, these slight trails, but also the sharpness within here. Any any faster than that, if flames are too, if, if shutter speed's too high on something that's got flame in it, you usually just end up with like little bits of orange, just generally where it's hotter. Too slow, this all becomes blurry red and you get the movement on the, the branch as well. So this has been perfectly balanced to just get enough movement but keep our subject that's on fire nice and sharp as well. Good at light trails, always good for a leading line image, um, nighttime or high ISO image. Um, again, extremely slow shutter speed. You could be looking at uh, a couple of seconds here at least. Um, this looks to be what say it's probably one car going through just from the, the these two lines here that just sort of suggest that it's one car that's gone through there. I could be wrong, could have been more, but uh, it's given us it's lit the road and given us the red trail lights at the same time. Um, yeah, this these these sort of shots are all about getting the right angle. If you want to get them floating like this, you need to make sure that you're getting um, the, your camera sort of in a position where the light isn't too too low to the ground, but it's actually coming up as well. Um, people usually achieve it in Britain by photographing buses or bigger trucks. Um, generally, the angles you get because you have to stand. You know, if you stand on things like overpasses and stuff like that, then the light trails are going to look quite close to the ground because you're shooting at a downward angle. So this photographer's used, um, he's placed his camera at a sort of lowish angle and managed to get the uh, make the trails look like they're hanging in the air here. Our grouping, um, this one was uh, put in for grouping um, and I picked this one out because of the depth of field used um, was adequate enough to get the grouping like all three 
members of the group, members of the thermoses of people. Um, this is quite a nostalgic image as well, because I'm sure my granddad used to have this mask. Um, but you're looking for a depth of field that takes you from the, the, the front to the back of every part of your element of your group. You want to avoid as best you can having a grouping where you know you've got the one in front is nice and crisp this one is slightly more focused but then the other one or two or three or four whatever it might be uh, are, are out of focus if it's a group and you want to make them feel like they are part of the group so do your best to keep an aperture that has them all in focus there this probably could have done with an aperture slightly higher just as these were bleeding out into the uh, the white background. So if you're doing any home studio stuff, um, or maybe even just one slightly, one step up on the shutter speed, just to stop these blending out. If you're doing any home studio stuff, you're photographing things like bottles or stuff that might bleed into the background, just be careful of that. So make sure you have a high enough aperture to get all your elements in focus. Uh, this one probably an f8 upwards um, to get from this point here which is the front part to the back part uh, nice and crisp but it could probably get it done with another step up in the shutter speed just to make sure that these lids didn't blend into our background Framing, um, framing is a, a very creative shot that we can do and it requires good use, good balance of our shutter and aperture and ISO, especially because if you're doing this type of framing shot, looking out from somewhere, then you are gonna run the risk of having um, your, uh, your frame or part of your frame darker than the other part. Uh, for example, our interior part here is quite dark, but there's a lot of detail captured here. So this is either a slightly slower shutter speed, hard to tell because there doesn't seem to be a lot of movement happening over here in the water, um, but an aperture that is giving us depth of field quite close actually, looking at this. Um, definitely from this point, the bottom of the frame, um, these are slightly softer. That might be depending on the focal length of the lens but we've definitely got depth of field all the way to those hills at the back so yeah that's going to be up in the, in the high teens or 20s for for depth of field because this is really sharp a lot of texture happening here and you, you can get the texture all the way back there uh, this just looks slightly soft because of the light haze coming through from what seems to be a setting sun um, but the thing that suggests to me a slightly slower aperture and I'm not talking seconds or anything, I'm maybe talking about a thirtieth of a second, maybe even a fifteenth. It's just that this light that's coming in here from this uh, this frame, this open frame, is just lighting up these areas. Um, if it was too high an aperture, then this dark patch here would be bleeding out towards the camera. So you need to be careful that when you're using a frame, some people go for, like this would be completely black all around here and we'll be looking out of this this hole here at this scene but if you can try and bring in light into some of this it just gives us a more sense of the the form of the frame that you're using of course we've looked at some examples in the feedback and that where the frame has been silhouetted uh, and that's been the key concept behind it but uh, you might just need to balance both up Another good example of framing using these branches here to frame what's going on here, but you want to be careful that uh, if you use too wide a, a, an aperture, too wide a depth of field, because it's only this area here that seems to be in focus, these branches back here. If it's too wide, these branches up the front that's creating our frame, sometimes they run the risk of going a bit too blurry, like down here. Um, it's, it, it works quite well here, but I've seen a lot of examples or images from students in the past where 
the uh, the blocker swirl and and the the uh, that out of focus effect that's happening just end up making these look like big brown splodges uh, that could be quite dis distracting. I mean, the more I'm looking at, it, the more I feel like this bit here is, is just starting to become more distracting because you've got these that are a bit more crisp. Um, I'd almost prefer to have you know these branches here as crisp as these ones here, uh, just to give me that sense of unity throughout the image. Because it's, the more I look at it, the more that these two, this V shape here, uh, just seems a bit out of place. Um, it's effective, but again, the depth field is then creating this splodginess, this out of focus um, depth of field area that's just, uh, you know, creating this effect here that's just detracting from the image a bit more. Okay, our next image. We looked at this one once before in one of the images. Um, good sort of framing, leading lines, etc. Shallow depth of field, but making sure that um, everything here is in focus. But also making sure that our reference point, so this doesn't feel like, because when I see a lot of these, I always think, oh, is that just, is that just a cutout being put on there? But the fact that you've got the guy here out of focus actually helps enforce how effective this shot is because you know it's not fake. Okay, he's in exactly the same position and positions, etc., feet positions as he is there. Come up to this gray line, come up to this gray line here. So that depth of field has been achieved quite nicely. Higher shutter speed because this hand isn't moving at all, it's nice and crisp um, but making sure that the person who's who's on the frame, in the image there, is actually in the frame there and again you just uh, verify that the picture you're taking is real, it's not some sort of Photoshop trickery going on. I would say this image as well has been cooled down slightly these blues overall are a bit cooler, so the white balance and the colouring that's been used has cooled it down and for the most part, maybe not so much on the phone screen because these are quite rich blacks, but the shadows all around here, all down here, have got quite a flat look. So the tone curve in the post processing has been lifted there. Nice leading lines again, the depth of field is slightly bigger than what we'd expect. Most people would just focus on the uh, the subject, the person in the photograph and just go for something like an F4 but here the aperture is slightly higher than you'd expect shutter speeds are quite high because they're actually moving down, they're engaged with something at the bottom there, they're moving towards it but this is absolutely crystal clear but the high aperture that's been used is effective because it allows this line back here to be nice and sharp and have texture to it. That faint line there as well, the texture on this back wall. It just then juxtaposes from the person, from this texture, but keeps all these lines, all these leading lines crisscrossing through our image, nice and sharp. So don't get um, blinkered if you've got a person moving through your image in just that's, that's it, that's all I need to get in focus just her, think as well as about if you're having leading lines coming through and you're using big shapes like this where you've got architectural shapes you know, if you use a higher aperture can you make these look sharper, can you bring in texture, can you bring in the right amount of colour etc to frame this up and add impact to the image again very difficult to do uh, sometimes this nighttime photography. Um, it's all balancing up your aperture and your shutter uh, here, quite a high aperture. And this is for two reasons. If you're doing nighttime stuff, buildings, and I guess in the situation we're in right now, it might be whatever you can point out your window or your back garden. But uh, 
I would say it suggests to me a high aperture one because of the amount of detail from in front of us going down here. Um, I've been here a couple of times, so I know how long these uh, these little um, pools of water are. Um, and you can see detail all the way back to the back of the, the roof of the Louvre. But also these uh, these little flares on the lights. If your shutter speed comes down too too much, you might you might have noticed this if you've done things like um, roads at night time, night trails, etc. But the slower the the shutter speed or the, the, the wider the aperture, I should say, the more these flare out, they become quite distracting. So the darker your exposure or underexposure, the more these coming in and become a bit more controlled. Um, I would say the shutter speed is slightly higher just because of the amount that's lifted in the shadows here and how well balanced these highlights are around here as well. So a high shutter and um, sorry, a high aperture definitely keep this nice and crisp. Shutter speed wise, not your usual what you'd expect at nighttime photography of this, you know, a second or two or three, but I would say maybe a tenth, a fifth of a second. Um, as well, one of the other things that gives it away is the fact that the flag is is quite quite steady as well and there is slight movement on the water it's not crystal clear if this was a but it's not too blurry again so it's giving me the impression that it's not as far down as a second but maybe about a fifth of a second so if this had gone to a second or two this would be slightly blurrier or even more glass like and if it was sharp then we'd see detail happening in the reflection but we'd get more ripples going across the water. Definitely have to go back to Paris very soon. So here we have um, grouping and also colour. Um, again, not the, not the sharpest of shots, but you know, sometimes we get images in that aren't pin sharp but they have uses you know there's this there's things happening here this is this is a great grouping this is a great shape this is great color it's juxtaposing color um and this isn't the fact that it's too wide a shutter it's literally that the focus point sometimes just gets missed um i'm struggling to actually see where the focus is so that would suggest that because there isn't uh, many areas that are very sharp or anything that suggests that we've hit the wrong focus point. Um, two things could be happening here. One, it could just be one of those random shots where in a burst or whatever, just the focus point hasn't landed somewhere. So this is, these are soft. These are soft here. Definitely there. Um, the log is soft, you'd expect this line to be quite crisp. You'd expect some of these lines to be quite crisp as well and see some of the texture going on here and some of the texture in here, but we're not. So two things could be happening here. One, the shutter speed might be too slow and this could be just a little bit of movement from something as simple as breathing. Okay, so if we're using uh, a focal length of, uh, this looks like it could be like 85 mil, or above but we might have been on a thirtieth of a second so just enough where it's not fuzzy but it's just enough where it's a bit soft or the focus point hasn't um, hasn't hit so from that what you can take away is that one try and make sure if you're hand holding that your shutter speed is fast enough to achieve the, the exposure you want um, by matching it to the focal length so if you're going above 100 that your shutter speed doesn't come below 125 um, but also that trying as much as you can I mean this is a setup shot this is a structured shot these apples are our pairs have been placed here um, they're pairs yeah not apples uh, their pairs uh, have been placed here on this on this branch but you know you've got to take you've got to spend some time taking shots put a focus point here put one 
take a shot, put it there, take a shot, put it there, you know, take a shot, put it there, put it here, try four or five different shots, try moving the focus point around, not always staying on the same place, you know, you've got a nice bit of contrast there with this hole in it here, try putting your focus point there, an aperture of f4, f5.6, we make sure that these lines here are nice and crisp and sharp this outline here and we'd get some texture but we'd still retain this blurry background okay from the greens to uh, juxtapose that color it just needs you to take your time um, making sure that you are things are in focus if you just whip out the camera whip it up to your eye take a fire a few shots and then walk off things like this happen all the time and uh, I say that from experience you know, the shots think, oh yeah, that was an easy shot, got that one. Get back on the computer and it's like, oh, it's a bit soft. Oh, should I should have spent some more time just making sure my focus point was where it should have been. And finally, um, I love shots like this. I like the colours in this, the light, the movement. Extremely high aperture. I mean, this black is noisy as hell, but it adds to it. It gives a sort of vintage effect at the same time to it. It doesn't detract from the image whatsoever. This image still has impact. Um, it has the the movement, the uh, the color and the light. So this has got high ISO, slow shutter, and looking at it, I would say a sort of midpoint aperture on it as well, depending on where the the focus point's been. But uh, again, it's a, it's an abstract image. It's experimental, but it's effective. It works. There's a, you know, the more you look at it, the more you see this little line of blue going through here that just juxtaposes against the purples. So you've got the, the red and the yellows. I mean, the yellow is almost leading you up to it. The red's almost warning you not to go any further. But then there's a, this purple movement's really good as well. And the way that the shot has been, uh, the way that the, uh, the lighting's been used, you know, you've got these darkness creeping in here is almost a perfect circle with the way that the, the darkness has been used to frame it to frame it in so a great image but pushing the camera to the, the maximum of the ability so just some technical aspects there for you to think about as you go about creating your images for your portfolio any questions on setting these sort of things up on your camera uh, please do give me a shout uh, let me know what sort of camera you've got uh, if you're trying to do it with your phone, let me know what apps you're using so that I can investigate if you have any issues. Um, I don't know every single app, I don't know every single device, or I don't know every single camera, but I will always do my best to help you out as best I can. Okay, good luck, take care.